Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'da habitu fillah Continue on in our study of tafsir of Surah Al-Surah Al-Ma'un using the tafsir of Imam Sa'di Rahimahullah Ta'ala we were discussing the ayat, <coughs> the second ayat, the second ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, For that it can lady you do team. That he is he who repulses the orphan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to those. Sifat al madhmuma these negative or sinful traits, which we do not want to possess, of course. That is, he who repel, uh, repulses the orphan, those people who turn away the orphan. Imam Asadi says, who drives the orphans away harshly and cruelly, showing no mercy towards them due to their hard hearts. They do not feel eager for the reward or fear punishment. This shows us that from those negative characteristics is that they repulse the orphans, they turn them away harshly. This is a indication of what's in their heart, that their heart has some marad, some sickness, that their heart has some uh, harshness and is uh, not befitting of the traits of a mu'min, of the believer. That hardness in their hearts. A lack of uh, harshness, cruelty, and which is the opposite of that is a lack of mercy. Not having the mercy that a rahman has bestowed upon his creation. A rahim He's given his mercy specifically to those he loves and the mu'mineen, or from amongst the mu'mineen. But out of his mercy, he gives his mercy to even those who disbelieve in him, even those who commit shirk with him, even though, even those who hate him, not just that they commit shirk, because they may have some love for Allah, but they love others with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, equal. Or they worship others along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what about those from amongst his creatures who detest deen totally? And detest and deny that there's a Rabbil Alami, that there's a Lord of the heavens and earth, of all things. Al Khalik, the creator of the heavens and earth. What about these ones? Allah still gives them mercy. SubhanAllah, how many of us will be merciful to our enemies? How many of us will be merciful to those who even cause us a little bit of harm? And how many of us are not even merciful to the orphans and the needy, the people who beg from us, and others who just have general needs? We show no mercy towards the creation. Look at those shayateen who claim they represent Islam when in fact they re represent Hizb al-Shaitan. And I'm talking about Daesh and other groups. Where is their mercy? They, they kill journalists. They kill people who have taken the Shahada as well. They kill civilians all the time of every ethnicity, every nationality, every religious persuasion. They don't care. As long as as they strike terror. Their main goal is terror. That's their main goal. It's a type of retribution, they believe, and it's terror. No mercy. No mercy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created mercy in order to add a justice for his slaves. His slaves. So amongst those sifat of these people, 
these people who display hypocrisy is that they do not feel eager for the reward or fear the punishment. Why? Because that goes back to the first ayat. These people, they deny the day of judgment. They deny that they will be re resurrected. They deny it in totality. So, if they deny the Yom Qiyama and they show no mercy, one of the reasons that many of these people show no mercy is why? Is because they don't believe they're held accountable. They're not striving for reward. Reward that helps us and encourages us to do sadaqah, to do good, to do good to the orphan, to do good to the needy. Because we believe as believers we'll be rewarded for it in the hereafter as well as in this life. In this life you feel good when you do something. Whenever you give someone something, in general you feel good. If it, if it is from you, if it's not out of coercion, you're not coerced. You're not forced to do it. But you do it, if you, especially you do it for the sake of life, you feel really good about that. And if no one else is around, you feel good about it even. That subhanAllah, you, you feel good. I, I fed that, that person who had nothing. Because I can imagine the feeling that they felt when they had a hot meal in that freezing cold night and it was raining and they lived under plastic. They wrapped themselves and their child with plastic. They have no shoes. They wear the same clothes. You can even see diseases or ailments that they suffer. You feel good about that. And especially as a mu'min, as a believer. Because you know that not only in this life do you feel good as, a, as just human compassion that should be innate to us, but you feel good if you did it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You said, Lillah, I'm going to buy this lunch. I'm going to buy this dinner. I'm going to buy this apple. I'm going to give this sambusa. I'm going to give whatever. Lillah. Or this meal. Or I'm going to pay for this one for the sake of Allah. And then I'm leaving the restaurant. They won't even know. Because I know they're from the Fuqara, the Musaqeen. The people who deny the bath they don't have those extra motivations to encourage them to do khayr. Because they don't believe there's a reckoning and they believe it's live now. They believe in now. Bas. They don't believe in the hereafter. They don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the sifat of those hypocrites and those mushrikun and those pagans. وَعِيَادٍ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ هَوْلَاءِ and those characteristics, I mean, you know, So they do not feel eager for the reward or fear the punishment. Fear the punishment of what? Of denying the yatim, denying the the people hakumalum, those people who have the right to ask. They, those people have a right. They need, and it's on you, O movement, because you have some money. You have a little bit. You have a little more. You might not be wealthy, but you have a little something extra. You can give to them, but you didn't give to them. So don't be like these people. Because they don't fear a punishment, because they don't believe there's a punishment. And they don't, they're not eager for reward, because they don't believe there's a reward. They believe it's just here and now. And urges not others on the feeding of al-miskeen, the poor. Imam Sa'di says, and consequently, they are more worthy of not feeding the poor themselves. Meaning they urge, they don't encourage other ones, of course, because they don't do it themselves. And what's even worse is those people who discourage that. May Allah protect us from those characteristics. They discourage people from feeding and helping. So I want to encourage myself and my brothers and sisters, because in the West, in, around the world, we, every, there's, you'll find people who need. I know in America we have a major homeless crisis. It's very easy to get some reward today. Today is, is still is still Ramadan. We're in the middle of the Ramadan. At the beginning, first third of Ramadan. Go out there and get that ajr. 
spend five bucks, five dollars. If you're in the UK, spend, I don't know, five pounds, three pounds, whatever it takes. And get that reward. Get some sins, some expiation for your sins. Follow the sunnah of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and help the masakeen. Likewise, you can be away from this sifat, this characteristic, by uh, donating to the charities or those people who can do it on your behalf. Those people who you know they travel to, they're, they're going back to Pakistan. They're going back to India for the summer. They're going back to Somalia. They're going to Hiragesa. They're going to visit <coughs> Addis Ababa. <coughs> they're going wherever. And you know that in all those countries there's plenty of musakim. And there's plenty of yatim. Everywhere there is in the world. But some places even more so. So make sure you give something. And do it now in Ramadan. Do it before you don't know you're going to die. Spend a little bit of that. And may Allah bless us to spend. Ameen, ya Rabbil Alameen. This is encouraged for me. i got to find some charity around here to do that. This is time. We don't know. And we need the forgiveness. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the next characteristic that we got to avoid. Or characteristic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, After, وَلَا يُحُدُّ عَلَى تَعَامِ الْمِسْكِينَ They don't encourage others to feed the poor. فَوَيْلُ لِلْمُسَلِّينَ Woe to those who pray. La ilaha illallah. Woe to those who pray. Woe we know is a strong word. Denoting a curse. Denoting that there's a stern warning or there's a stern warning about some sin that you could fall into. You better be away from. Woe to those performers of Salat. Of course we don't stop there. Imam Asadi said, who offer prayers regularly. These are the people who pray. Hopefully it's you and I that are praying regularly. But who delay their salat. SubhanAllah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave a stern warning to those who delay their salat. So these are the people who even pray. It's not those people who do. What about the people who don't even pray? The Prophet وسلم, said, Whoever leaves the prayer is disbelieved. May Allah protect us from ever dis disbelieving and ever leaving the salat. To even be under that threat. So some of the scholars, the scholars differ whether they're, uh, they have disbelief, they're, they're, if you leave the Salat, if you're uh, a disbeliever, you, you don't get prayed over, your marriage is no longer uh, valid, you're all, all of it, you, you don't, if, if you die, you're not prayed over, you don't inherit, the people, no one inherits from you, all of these kind of things. The scholars debate whether this person is outside the fold of Islam or they are just a wicked sinner, the one who's left the prayer. The Prophet والسلام, though, and, and the Sahaba, it seems pretty clear the evidence is very strong to support that they disbelieve. The one who leaves the prayer. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a threat about those people who delay the prayers, delay it from their times. Ignoring, fulfilling its obligations. So they're lazy in the prayer. They are, uh, they don't fulfill it on its time. We're not saying that they, we're not talking about struggling to get out of the bed for Fajr. You struggle. It is a struggle. It's, no one can say that it's not. Say, oh yeah, your whole life is just easy, especially when you have jobs, you have families, you have all kind of tons of obligations, all kind of stress. The Salat is there to relieve some of that pressure. But at the same time, it's not easy. When you have to work at 5 o'clock in the morning or 6 o'clock in the morning and then Fajr comes in at 3 and you have to get up for Fajr, make wudu, and then go to the masjid maybe. Maybe. That's not easy. There's mushakka in that. There's difficulty in that. That's why the reward is so great. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you knew the reward of the Fajr and the Isha prayer, you would crawl to the masjid. You would come crawling. That lets us know immense reward. But leaving that prayer, or leaving it from its time, never do everything possible. Always 
to make the salat, at least know the awqat to salat, at least know those prayer times. Maybe you have a job, maybe you do some, you're a truck driver, you're always on the road, you're, you're a surgeon, you're whatever, but try to get those prayers in their time. Vuhr comes in at 11.35, for example. They pray in the masjid at 12, maybe. If you can't make either of those, make sure that you pray it before Asr. And pray it within its time. And pray it before the last part, the dangerous part, which is close to Asr. That is the waqt al Don't pray in that time if you can help it. But strive your best to pray in its, its waqt. And don't make it a regular habit to miss the uh, miss the time and miss the jama'ah and miss all those fu'ayid and fadayid. But strive your best. So Imam Sa'adi said, but who delay their salat by not properly offering prayer, delaying it from its stated fixed time, and ignoring fulfilling its obligations. They do this on account of their carelessness concerning Allah's commands pertaining to prayer, which is one of the most significant aspects of worship amongst the best acts that draw one close to Allah. This is your your communication with your Lord. Delaying the prayer from its stated time deservedly brings one blame and chastisement. However, unintentional forgetfulness regarding the prayer occurs to anyone, even the Prophet ﷺ, he said. Meaning, forgetting without the intention. You, you legitimately forgot. Sometimes, you know, it's rare, but you might forget. Because you, maybe you thought you prayed. Or whatever, you're in a different environment today. Today you went out on the beach and whatever, or you did this activity, you did this, you went hiking and you, you thought you prayed Dhuhr and whoa, it's almost Asr, I forgot Dhuhr, the time went by so fast. So then you pray. That, that, that can happen. Allah describes those who do these evil things of showing off cruelty and hard-heartedness, saying that they are those who do good deeds only to be seen. So you don't want to be of those who, who do things show, to show off. This is a riya. The Prophet ﷺ said, أَخَافَ عَلَى أُمَّتِي أَشِرْكَ الْأَسْكَرْ وَسُوءِ الْعَنُوْ وَهُوَ الْرِيَا وَكَمَا قَالَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ As is mentioned in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, what means, the thing I'm most fearful of my, for my ummah is shirk al-askar. It's a small minor shirk, it's called shirk, minor shirk. And then when it's asked about it, it's called a riya, which is showing off. So if you show off, meaning that you're you're doing an act of ibadah, but you're doing it to please the people. You make your prayer even more beautiful. The chest goes up, the head is down, and you're just, you know, you, uh, maybe you even, probably not shed a tear, but you, you're doing it for the people, not for Allah Azza wa Jal. You're doing whatever it is, you give the sadaqah. Not to encourage the people, but to show off. Yeah, I got it like that. I got big paper. Here it is. Bow. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a righteous person. Bow. Here. SubhanAllah. What about the hadith? I guess this tafsir is going to be longer than I wanted it to be. But let's try to get some of these benefits. What about the hadith? I believe it's hadith of Ibn Abbas. Radiyallahu ta'ala. About the three. Doing the most highest deeds. Supposedly for Allah. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned three on the Day of Judgment who will be brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one, as we just mentioned in the first part of the hadith, is the mujahid, the supposed martyr. So all these websites and all these magazines and all these publications, all the kalama people, so and so is a martyr. We don't know. But you hope that for them if they die doing something fi la. But if they die doing a suicide bombing or some evil like this, we could care less about them. And their reckoning is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blowing themselves to bits and all the damage and evil that they spread, especially outside of combat zones.
The Prophet ﷺ mentioned three on the Day of Judgment who will be brought before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the first is the one who's a martyr. And it will be asked, what did you do for me? And he said, I, I fought for you. I fought for your sake. Uh, and Allah will say, you lied, but rather you did it so the people would say that you were a uh, mujahid. Uh, and it was said. Uh, and then he will be ordered, he will be dragged into the hellfire. This person did one of the highest deeds. And he was thrown in the hellfire for it. Why? Because of Riya and Suma. That he was doing it to show off and to be heard, have his name heard amongst the people. And we'll shortly talk about the second one.